Oh, okay. Well, I'm J.D. Deluzio, um, author of short stories and articles and such. I have a novel out with Brain Lag from last November called The Con, and I have an anthology coming out sometime in uh, next year, early next year, called Live Nude Aliens and Other Stories, which is a mixture of previously published um, as well as brand new material. I'm Stephen B. Pearl. I'm multiply published, and I have uh, my Tinker's World series with Brain Lag and the Freedom Saga, Cloning Freedom, with Brain Lag, and you can see the covers behind me. And it's basically, if you want to talk about research, their research. <laughs> Thank you, and Natasha. Hey guys, so my name's Natasha, I'm 23, I live in Toronto. Uh, so I'm gonna be publishing my very first novel in exactly a month today, October 16th, called Sins and Science. It's a science fiction fantasy slash horror novel coming out soon, so I'm super excited about that and I'm really happy to be here with you guys today. Thank you, and uh, sorry to the uh, other panelists here, I'm just going to repeat the opening here because the chat told me that uh, nobody could hear me. So again, welcome to uh, What is the Average Airspeed of an Unladen Swallow, a panel on researching for writers. Uh, as a reminder, for those of you coming here from Gen Con, please be sure to go into the event details for this event and click turn in your ticket to event organizer. This is very important, so please be sure to do that. And let's just get right into it and start with the basics. Uh, what do you research when you're about to write a novel? Would anyone like to take this one? Uh, I'll, I'll give a go if no one else. Um, first thing, I it depends on what the novel is. Obviously, if you're doing Vikings in the 900s, you're going to research Vikings in the 900s. By the way, they were called Norse to Viking is to raid, and it's basically calling pirates. Um, so if you're going to be doing science fiction, uh, currently I'm work working on one that uh, I'm researching ion drives and futuristic, near, relatively near future uh, life support systems. So the question really comes down, what are you going to write? That's what you're going to research. And if you're going to write current day, where are you going to write? Because you're going to re research the area. If you're doing something in the Badlands of Nevada, well, take a trip to the Badlands of Nevada. For one thing, they're beautiful, but. <laughs> yeah, it depends very much, obviously, on what you're writing. I, I One of the things I will probably reference a lot is um, – uh, there's a novella in, in Live Nude Aliens, which is, is new, uh, called uh, Flag Whistle Stop, which is set in 1971, except in 1953, at the height of the flying saucer craze, actual aliens landed. Um, am I freeze frozen here? We can still hear you just fine. So. Okay, great. I got the stupidest expression here. Okay, in the freeze. <laughs> um, so uh, what happens is... Uh, Actual aliens have landed in uh, at the height of the flying saucer craze. Hopefully my camera comes back. Um, so I had to do a heck of a lot of research. I'll talk about along the way on all kinds of things. Because you're speculating, how would the world have changed between 1953 and 1971 if we simply knew that extraterrestrials were out there, could visit us again anytime, had interacted with us, and so forth. So I ended up interacting uh, or researching a ridiculous number of things um, along the way. But sometimes in very ordinary stories, you end up doing research or less, less spectacular ones. So uh, a piece called um, a Book of Dennis. Uh, I wanted a particular location, a particular location to be a real location. Um, so I figured out, well, he's leaving from here and he's going approximately here, looked at a map, said, yeah, that's about where he would stop for, for, uh, dinner. So I drove there, I drove to this, this small town in Ontario. And not only did I get some real details that were quite interesting 
to give it a sense of a real place, uh, I inadvertently stumbled over uh, an almost completely forgotten cryptozoological story from Ontario history, wrote an article about it, and probably played a not, not insignificant part, because when I started researching that article, there were exactly two references online to this thing. A year later, there were multiple references, and my article was cited in a Scottish TV documentary about cryptozoology. <laughs> so, uh, and who knows? Who knows how far it went? There's also now a local softball team, or, or hardball team, named for the up till then largely forgotten. But I also know that around the same time, someone else locally had had stumbled over it. So who knows what the origin was? Yeah. Oh, wow, fair. Yeah. JD, just to build a bit on what you're saying about researching the small details. So that's something I love to do. Research is like key to setting because without a good, solid, believable setting that you've well researched, readers aren't going to be drawn in. Right. And it's something, for example, I find Stephen King does such a great job of. I've never been to Maine, but like just from reading his novels, I feel like I have because he'll talk about things like street names and things like that. That'll just place you there. So that's the kind of thing I like to do. I'll go on Google Maps and see what realistically my character could have gone down here and then made a right on this street. And that's how you can try to like through research bring your setting to life. And this is of particular interest in the case of Sins and Science, because uh, I think unlike a lot of the fiction that uh, J.D. and Stephen write, I mean, Stephen's got fiction from all over the place, but uh, Sins and Science takes place in Liverpool, which was a very specific and yet very well fleshed out location. Uh, do you want to elaborate a bit on the research involved with that? Absolutely. So um, I first, I've always had a bit of an interest in the north of the UK. My family's from up there, up in Barrow and Furness, which is even more north than uh, Liverpool. And, um, and uh, then uh, I got, when I had the idea for Sins of Science, Sins and Science, which is about a scientist who uh, tries to create an afterlife by putting like microchips in people's brains. And when they die, they go to this virtual afterlife. If you read the novel, you'll see whether it worked or not. And the reason I thought of Liverpool is because um, the University of Liverpool actually does have a huge like um, like like uh, uh, artificial intelligence department. Like they have, they do a lot of research into that. And because I'm already interested in the north of the UK, I thought that would be a really cool place to do the setting. I also find Liverpool such a cool city that people tend to not talk about a lot. Um, other outside of like, I don't know, references to the Beatles, but there's so much character to that city. And I think it's just a great place for a setting. It's very diverse. It's, it's um, yeah. So I, I was on Google Maps constantly looking through Liverpool to try to make my setting as realistic as possible. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, how about let's, this is probably a quick to answer question, but why do we research? And uh, JD, do you want to start us off there? Do we have JD? I think we may. I think I would like to uh, um, log off and log back in because I'm having serious problems with my tech. So uh, I will be back in this conversation in just a minute, I hope. And uh, hopefully I won't miss anything uh, that I, I can't build. So if you could get to me maybe next or third, that would be great. No worries. Uh, Stephen, how about you tell us why do we research such things for the stories? Well, <clears throat> good fiction has to, I, I, I'm of the opinion, good fiction has to be based in good fact. That doesn't mean you can't go to the fantastic. I mean, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and I agree with that. But you can't have somebody bopping around outside the spaceship in hard vacuum with no ill effects without a tech, you know, you can't have them doing their birthday suit. Um, so you have to be true to science to that point. And also there's nothing worse for being jerked out of the read or jerked out of the entertainment than really, really glaringly bad science. I'm a generalist. 
I am not a physicist. I am not a chemist. I am a generalist. However, interplanetary, interstellar, intergalactic, get that straight. Get that level straight. Uh, the Eureka television series, I was binge watching it for a while because I'd been told good things. And it got to one episode where they had a mold turning base metals into gold. Now, a mold can affect change at a chemical level. You're talking about change at a molecular level. To do it, you need a cyclotron. It can be done. It has been done. The gold would be worth something like uh, $50,000 an ounce. I mean, it's completely uneconomically feasible. But that simple thing of know at least that much that you can get the general brackets correct, uh, what I aim for and what I think anybody should aim for in the research is what I call a children's book level of understanding. You know it well enough that a sympathetic person who follows that as their science would be willing to say, okay, I can blur the lines and fudge it here and fudge it here. And all right, maybe the foundation of this is correct. And it's not making my teeth hurt. But if it makes your teeth hurt, then I think it's really degrades the read. And I don't think it has a place. Well put. Natasha? Right, yeah, no, very similitude. It's it's key, right? You need it needs to be believable. It doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, Star Wars, they're shooting in outer space and you hear the sounds of it and it's still fun and awesome. But you know, you it can't just totally like like Stephen was saying, just jerk you out because you're like, this makes no sense. And that does happen. What like I think the movie that did the most impressive job of just respecting the laws of physics is interstellar. And that's just a stunning movie how they respected string theory. Like I, I recommend it if anyone hasn't seen it, if you want to see like the perfect example of science fiction that is as true as possible to the science interstellar. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, we, we are writers. We, we're not all physicists uh, or scientists. We can't know for sure if everything we're saying makes sense to people with a certain expertise in a field. But what we can do is ask their opinion. So when I wrote the first draft of my novel, I had a lot of computer science that I was kind of just inventing. I don't know anything about coding. So I had one of my friends who's a programmer read it. And I was like, please let me know which parts of this makes you cringe and how I can fix it. And so that's what he did. So I think it's a, it's it's a good idea to just seek advice from people who know more than we do, right? Absolutely. Well, well, you. well welcome yeah. back, JD. And, yeah. Uh, sorry, my my computer decided to update, and it played havoc with um, the tech. So of course, hopefully, I'm still here. All right. Um, Fingers crossed. Uh, just yeah, getting back. Super talking about getting outside help. Uh, I just wanted to uh, follow up on something Natasha said a moment ago about the movie Interstellar. Uh, a few years ago, I read a book called The Science of Interstellar, which I also found a really fascinating read because it had a lot of information on black holes and such and how uh, a lot of the elements of the story would actually work. Uh, it was written by the primary science um, consultant on the movie. And uh, in fact, he and the writer, or the original writer, one of the two, you know, they actually pitched the movie together. And that was kind of the big thing, was he wanted a movie that was actually based in real science. So, uh, yeah, JD, I think we're still sort of talking along the lines of uh, why we research. Well, I, again, to get something that's credible, that's plausible, um, that has some real world weight, that obviously you're going to make mistakes, but that you have at least have few or you know where they're likely to be. Um, obviously, the story and characters are more important, but um, you know, there was a, a person with uh, the con who read strictly for math 
there's almost no math in the con other than timelines. But I got a very mathematically gifted friend of mine because I said, look, there's a case where uh, the character Patty does this math thing in her head and everyone goes, what the heck just happened? And I said, two things about this problem that I put in there. I said, one, I'm guessing because I'm not a super skilled mathematician. This, first of all, it has to be right. <laughs> Secondly, it has to be the kind of thing uh, that a, a, a sufficiently intelligent, Patty's sort of a teenage genius geek girl, um, could do in her head like that. Um, I because I hate fake genius in in films and books. I hate you know where the film where someone hits three keys on their uh, apple and suddenly they're into the Pentagon or something. So this has to be believably something that a sufficiently intelligent teenager who's mathematically gifted could simply see. And the everyone else in the room is going, what? Because even though most people just read through that part, oh, she did something smart. I thought the people who know math, I want them to, to see that that's correct. Uh, same thing with the hack that they perform. Um, I, I know a number of people with some experience in that field, and I have a number of uh, friends who are in IT, and I wanted to make sure that it would pass their sniff test. This hack could be performed and not be detected, like i.e. not be traced. Because the biggest problem is, is usually not performing the hack it's performing the hack and not having you know every relevant agency know exactly who you are 10 minutes later um so things like that i like i want them to be as much as possible be passable if some things have to be hand waved how did the aliens get to earth i have no clue um they they have to be hand waved um but i think that idea that you don't have to be an expert in everything, but you at least have to be convincing enough that people who might know something about what you're writing about are either aren't going to say that just would never happen, or if they do, it's something they'd be willing to let pass. And we've all we all have our limits. We've all seen that movie or read that book where we stopped and just rolled our eyes because there was something there that that would never happen that way. That doesn't make any sense in terms of that particular thing that you might happen to know about. I've got a good example, but I'll save it for later if there's time. Thank you. One of the things that I find very useful in this, um, I've recently had to do, believe it or not, navigational plots for interplanetary travel. <laughs> and you talk about mind-boggling, mind-numbing. And then you can simplify it really well by saying, yeah, but you've got acceleration phase, coast, deceleration phase. And if you're talking about it being five light, year, flight, five light hours away and you're traveling at 20% of the speed of light, well, five times five is 25. Your total trip duration isn't going to be much more than 30 hours. And then you can have the navigator just say, Oh yeah, about four 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 days of give or less for uh, acceleration. Four days give or less for deceleration, and this many days in the middle. Um, it ties in nicely with the science. This idea of fudging the science so that you're still close enough that somebody who's willing to give you the benefit of the doubt isn't going to throw a conniption. And you know, I think part of it too is what's your intention by writing sci-fi. So when we look at the fathers of sci-fi, you have Jules Verne and H.G. Wells had, who had two totally different kinds of perspectives on what sci-fi should be. So Jules Verne, he was really like a purist. This has to be like scientifically plausible. I'm trying to predict the future here, not just like create far-fetched ideas. That's just fantasy. It's silly, right? He was like really a purist and it was like he's someone who would have really liked Interstellar, you know? But then you have H.G. Wells who was using science fiction as a way of commenting on his current society back in the Victorian era. So, you know, the, you know, the Eloy and the Morlocks, like 
that these creatures weren't, you know, the creation of something that he'd really rigorously scientifically evaluated would be living this way. It was a way of commenting on the current situation. And Jules Verne actually was quite critical of H.G. Wells because of his writing. But I find H.G. Wells absolutely brilliant. Um, you mm-hmm. take like, yeah, like in the time machine, he's just kind of, it's like, it's almost like as if science fiction is a hyperbole he's using to uh, show just the extremes of um, the industrialization at the time. So it really depends what are you trying to achieve here through science fiction. And that's where you're going to want to be really rigorous or can you allow more gray zone in your science? What's your level of reality in any story? I think is pretty important. Uh, we tolerate things, things in comedy we would never accept in drama, obviously, or in satire even more so. Mm-hmm. All right, great conversation so far. Let's move on to kind of the nuts and bolts. How do we research for our stories? Uh, JD, would you like to start us off this time? (laughs) Um, Obsessively, as you probably know, um, uh, having edited me and and received like copious pages of notes explaining the buried pun on page 170 or whatever, um, the... um, Flying Whistle Stop was interesting, and it took me a lot longer than I'd hoped. I was planning to finish something else this summer, but Flying Whistle Stop stretched out. And part of that was research, because I'm trying to imagine an entirely altered in 1971. And some of it had to be based in reality, and some of it I could just say, look, this happened. Um and, and that raises all sorts of interesting questions. So, for instance, because I actually set it in a real location, um, I, I got access to uh, from a library, despite there being a pandemic on, on maps. And I thought, oh, city developed significantly between 1953 and 71. That was a huge period of expansion. That expansion would now potentially happen differently since that city was one of the landing sites. Um you start, I spent a ton of, I already had background in the space program, but I spent a ton of time reviewing the space program because in the alternate reality, like we have uh, Werder von Braun's wet dream of a space program. The entire world went crazy for space flight, more so than even happened in reality because there was someone out there um, and that someone could drop by or someone maybe less friendly could drop by and so forth. So suddenly you start looking at what were they trying to do? What were some of the ideas they had for the space program that never got off the ground or could have got off the ground, but there were political issues and so forth. Um, I mean, I arbitrarily picked a date in 1953 because um, an obscure group had declared that World Contact Day for telepathic contact with aliens. And I thought that would be a funny date to pick, except the date I picked, Korea, the Korean War is coming up on a ceasefire in real history. Stalin has just died. So Russia is at a very particular place. Um, They're they're studying, they're beginning, the the, the fact that the birth control pill could actually work is now a concept, although the public doesn't know it. Rock and roll is getting off the ground, yada, yada, yada. Uh, Korea has, um, Vietnam has not been uh, uh, partitioned. Um, So suddenly, you have all of these things that would be affected and then you have to go forward. So there was a lot of that because there's a musical element. There was a lot of research into how pop music developed. Um, so you do a lot. And then of course, I also had to look at UFO folklore because the UFO folklore was at one of its heydays in 1953. And that was very deliberate. And I think the thing that I kept tripping over, even though I knew it, was the fact that the entire UFO phenomena developed without anyone giving, you know, flying rats hindquarters for Roswell. Absol- Roswell had absolutely no influence for 30 years. It was all traced to Kenneth Arnold. Project Blue Book didn't look at Roswell. The UFO documentaries of the 50s did not mention Roswell. It wasn't for 30 years later that you suddenly got these dubious claims of, of aliens at the Roswell crash, that it became famous. And then it got retrofitted into a history it had never been part of. So I said, okay, I am not mentioning Roswell anywhere in this story because it would be meaningless to everyone. Um, 
so you start trembling over things and saying, can you use that? You know, can I have Marvin the Martian say this line because he existed in 1947, but you know, the earth shattering kaboom line was in a late fifties cartoon. Would that cartoon have been made? I don't know. I just decided it was, um, some things you just have to go with and some things you think mm, that wouldn't have been a thing or that might have not developed that way. And uh, one of the things that you've told me that uh, was a really helpful source for uh, searching up, you know, kind of the state of the world at that time in history was you looked at old newspapers through like microfiche at the library. And I think that's uh, an excellent idea for, you know, somewhat contemporary stories anyway. Now, obviously, there will be a little bit of a slant, but uh, that's uh, definitely a good avenue to take. Uh, Natasha, you kind of uh, touched on this a little earlier, talking about uh, going into Google Maps and looking up uh, Liverpool and a couple of the other things you said. But uh, how do you do your research? Like, I definitely first create the plot in my mind. And then I, I see research as kind of a way of just kind of, uh, you know, cleaning out the rough edges, making sure everything works. You don't want research and being really, really close to like the facts and all that, getting caught up in that to get in the way of the creative process. I really think it's important to first just create in a kind of like unhinged way, just write your story. Then after that, you can start worrying and fussing about those kinds of details. And, you know, at the end of the day, if like it's going to totally just get in the way of your plot, then then it's OK. You can you can just push past that. Right. So um, um, I think it's important first to just let the creative process happen. Then research is kind of part of the fine tuning kind of it's part of the nitpicking, just like finding all those typos and all those words you use wrong. It, you also want to then throw in your research, make sure that everything lines up as well as you want it to um, for your story to be effective and believable for your readers. Um, so I really see it as part of the refining process rather than the um, actual uh, initial creative process, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you. And uh, I think it's uh, nice to be moving on to Stephen here because I know you take a bit of a different view of the research. <laughs> and I, I love having these different uh, perspectives on it. So please tell us, how do you do your research? Okay, it just goes to show there's no right way, there's no wrong way. It's what works for you. Because I start, uh, any any given book that I'm writing, I start by doing really heavy background into my world building. You know, the physics that I'm going to use, the things that are possible under the laws of nature, the things that are impossible under the laws of nature, what the tech level is. Um, in the Tinker series, they're a technology roughly 100 years in advance of our own, but the limiting factor is that there isn't power to run things. So it's what happens, you get these little pockets where you have power to run things and everywhere else is basically an 1800s technology. But, you know, so doing the research for that meant going a lot into what future um, sustainable energy generation is going to be. And um, I do a lot of stuff with the encyclopedia because the encyclopedia is wonderful in so much as it gives you enough background that you can fake it. And I know I've offended people by saying that all writing is faking it, but all writing is faking it. But it uh, well, most writing is faking it because I have not been in outer space. I have not uh, flown an interplanetary aircraft, uh, spacecraft between Earth and Uranus, but I can still write about it. And hopefully you haven't lived through a uh, technological apocalypse either. Well, power failures at my father's house. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, but yeah, continue, please. Oh, I just wanted to say, for sources, what the th one of the things I really like, I mentioned the encyclopedia, but I also really like magazines. Popular science, when it was around, was magnificent. 
because they gave you the article that gave you enough detail that you could take that and transpose it into your work without flooding you with technical jargon. And that works for me. <laughs> and uh, I know you've mentioned in previous panels that uh, you've also watched a lot of documentaries for a lot of other information. And I'm sure there's tons of free documentaries available on YouTube and such that you can access. Oh, huge numbers. It's this um, one that does a bunch of uh, animated overviews. And I forget the name of it. I can't recall it for the life of me. If I went up on my YouTube channel, I could find it. But they did one about terraforming Venus. And they got into the nitty-gritty of the Venusian atmosphere, which is hundreds of times thicker than Earth's and almost all carbon dioxide. And uh, that just opens up so many possibilities for space-based science fiction. Thank you, yes. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, sources, because you mentioned the encyclopedia, we mentioned the documentary. What are other good sources uh, for your research? And uh, as a follow-up, Wikipedia, yes or no? It depends on what you're doing with it. Um, the best use of Wikipedia is to get an overview that you take with a grain of salt and then try to independently verify. And you can often do that by looking at the citations in Wikipedia are often really good citations. Uh, so you get the overview, you say that's probably something to do with the reality of this topic. And if I really wanna know more, the, one of the first places you could go is, what are they citing? And, and are they doing it correctly? Um, because as you know, between a peer-reviewed article and the popular version of it that appears in the press, there's like some kind of game of telephone tag going on that changes the meaning. Um, to this day, and I literally, by the way, for this is for an article, I literally had to go and track down exactly a particular edition um, of a book because it always bugged me that there was no credibility at all to the continuously repeated claim that Ring Around the Rosy was about the bubonic plague. But there are two really famous people who it, that gets traced to. I finally found the edition. It's in a footnote where they mockingly refer to this ridiculous claim that was made recently in the early 20th century. Um, but they get cited as the people who said that. Um, and they never said that. They said they heard it kind of on the street. It was of recent origin, and it's stupid for all kinds of reasons. Uh, historically, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so sometimes like things like Wikipedia are great, but you, 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 don't, you don't rely on them. You use them as a starting point, and you say, if I need to know more about topic X, where do I go? And, and one of the places you might go is actually what Wikipedia might be citing, because their citations are often brilliant. Uh, Stephen, you were going to say something as well? I'm just nodding along. I agree with everything you said. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to, don't let my profs hear me say this, but I am a huge Wikipedia fan. I use it all the time. I find that it's just such a great resource for getting a surface level understanding of things that we don't know about. And yeah, JD, like just like what you were saying, it, then it can lead to other re like other things you can research, and then you start looking up other sources and things, right? And like, there's you can even if you really want to get in like the you know in the really fine details, Google Scholar is like a really user friendly source for academic peer reviewed papers. Um, so if ever there's something yeah you really want to fact check. I really like Google Scholar. I use it all the time. I use it in university for my master's, but I also use it for writing. Um, I'm a safe person in science. It was very Wikipedia inspired. So if ever things don't make sense, blame them, not me. <laughs> <laughs> people are good sources too. Um, you go to people and talk to them. So, you know, I one of the locations and one of the things I wrote um, Book of Dennis, I literally had a couple of people, including uh, go over certain locations 
including someone who as a 15 year old kid had been hanging out in, in Yorkville and was describing, you know, much older now what that experience was like. Um, and then things of that nature. Uh, so these things come out of, uh, move on but i i i've got one that i think we could probably use at the ending if, if, if the question comes up but people are kind of be very useful sources i mean you have to they're like wikipedia you have to take them with a grain of salt but often they'll give you some weird perspective where you go oh that's good that that now gives me a whole new way of looking at this that can I end up bringing a scene to life that maybe wasn't going anywhere or that wasn't as good as it could have been and you think oh yeah, the same way that we do with characters. You know, we steal bits of people we know and turn them into something that those people never were because it's now our character and not who that person was. Yeah, on characters, I've always had a bit of a theory, too, that characters are always a part of ourselves. Um, because, you know, where is our writing coming from? Well, us, right? And yeah, maybe it is based on people we know, but it's based on how we view them, right? And, you know, um, like, like, let's say, like, People who really believe in like Freud and those kinds of theories will tell you, well, the way you perceive others is actually things you're projecting within you onto them. So in a way, our characters are all just parts of ourselves. And I think that's super interesting that you would bring that up. So what are some of the challenges of uh, doing all this research and how do you overcome them? Stephen, would you like to uh, start? Finding out that you can't do the things that you want to because they're fl flatly impossible. Um, the math when you're trying to work out interplanetary distances is also, a, I had to reteach myself the uh, exponential things, you know, to the power of 10 to the 27th, things like that. Keep up your high school math. It will come in handy someday. <laughs> <laughs> well, those of us who uh, get really annoyed by uh, science fiction massively un uh, under portraying the speed of light, we thank you for that. Natasha, uh, challenges of research and how to overcome? Um, don't let it get too much in your head. Like, you don't want to just end up spiraling and, like, trying to make this as, like, absolutely truthful as possible that you're not even progressing in your work because you're just obsessing with, does this work? Does this make sense? Like, I was, like, I was just, like, at one point, I was, like, texting one of my friends who's a programmer, just these, like, massive messages, like, but what about this and this and this? And does it even make sense if I do this this way? And he was just, like, look, why don't you just use this one sentence so that you're keeping it vague? You're not getting into that level of detail and you don't have to worry about it. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do that. So, you know, don't let it get into your head. Don't obsess over the, like those, those really frustrating details that we just can't figure out. Like there, there's always a way of kind of like getting around it if you must. So yeah, just don't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> JD. You find exactly right. Find the balance. You want enough research that what you're doing is credible or at least you understand the basic issues that you might have to fudge. Um, and then remember that people are not reading a manual, they're reading a story, they're reading a novel. They want characters and a story and some interesting ideas. And if they wanted to know about the math related to interstellar travel, they would read a, you know, a peer reviewed article about the math related to interstellar travel. But that said, we've, we've all done that. And I had a rather amusing one when we were working through the con where um, I really, you know, most of the characters in the con come from real places. Uh, but three of them come from a completely fictitious town that appears in some of my writing. Um, and I had expressly stated the town was in Huron County, Ontario, because I know Huron County. I don't live there. I live near, near it. Problem is the school board that I, I gave the school a football team and that incidental detail comes up. The board that Huron County covers Huron County has never had football teams. They're, they're an anomaly in this part of Ontario for that reason. So I thought one, who cares? Or two, Huron County doesn't have this town 
or three, um, the various sports conferences permit you to um, to play if you don't have a, a that sport in your your board with a nearby board. If you you can get permission, you know you can get approval to do that. And so finally, I said, this really doesn't matter that much. I'm just not going to expressly say where along the Huron shore this county is. Maybe it's Huron County and they play somewhere else. Maybe it's, you know, one county up, which does have football teams. And then I'm not outright saying something that's false. So no one can get from me from Huron County, if anyone there has ever, ever reads this book. Um, and say, hey, that 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 obscure detail is inaccurate. And I didn't say specifically that's where it was. Uh, and that allowed me to say, I'm wasting time on this. <laughs> Change this one line and move on to what actually matters. Um, you know, which is is the story and the characters and and whether or not the alien in that that novel is is how people interact with an alien that may or may not really be there. Thank you. Uh, so we've got about 10 minutes left in the panel. Uh, if anyone in the chat has any questions, feel free to uh, type them in or if you have any comments or anything. Um, so yeah, this pretty much kind of covered my last question, which was about uh, falling down rabbit holes, or rather how to avoid falling down rabbit holes in your research. But uh, anybody have any interesting stories about good things that came out of uh, falling down those rabbit holes. Stephen? Good things that came out of falling down a rabbit hole. Um, can you come back to me? <laughs> sure. Natasha? Uh, um, you know what? Um, so in the writing process, I don't have great examples, but what I do have is prior random rabbit holes that I'd fallen in just random curiosity. I ended up just using in my books. So like, and I, like it, it can even just be for a, just like a, a joke or whatever. But for example, I, I, I'm someone who really, I'm just interested in like electoral results throughout the years per region in Canada. I'm a big nerd. And um, so then I just ended up writing in that one of my characters once ran for office in, like a few decades ago in this specific region where it would make sense that he lost because, you know, that would have been uh, Jean Chrétien's writing. And so like, I, I just ended up throwing in that detail for fun and it just gave another facet to that character. And then when I was having some of my friends and people like that read it over, they're like, I loved that bit. It was so random, but fun. So like often I use like prior rabbit holes I've fallen down just where I just have a bastion of knowledge for no reason in, and I'll write it into my books to just kind of add to it. Right. I yeah. Love, I, I love that. Absolutely. And uh, that, specific part in the book also it was just such a random trait that suddenly came up with the character and it's such an odd character that <laughs> who would have such a trait and it, it was wonderful uh before we get to you jd i'm just going to uh say someone in the chat scotty mike 06 in the chat says another useful research resource for fact checking is the stack Ex stack exchange network there are stacks for almost every topic. Similar caveats to Wikipedia, but its Q&A format means you can get answers to your own specific questions. So, uh, JD, any fun rabbit holes that uh, bore fruit for you? Well, I mean, I mentioned the the uh, Neath River Monster, uh, discovering that that was even a thing briefly in the 50s. Um, because I was going, wanted to get a sense of a real location, and I happened to go to New Hamburg, Ontario, and then I happened to stumble over a reference because I thought I should look at I, whatever I'm in a town like that. I look at the local history section because every small town library has like a shelf of bizarre local history, um, and and that's where I stumbled over that, uh, and and then later went went elsewhere to research it because the archives were were a town over, you know, I, the, the room got too small, I guess. I don't know. Um, but that kind of thing, I think, happens all the time where you stumble over a detail. It might be a fact or it might just be something where 
I've got to use that somewhere. So in another uh, foray to a different small town where I was looking through the local history, I thought the local history, there's this book of archival stuff and it's, they're all against weird, fancy, colorful backgrounds in this book. What? That's so weird. And then I looked at it and I realized they made this in the early 70s and they decided as their scrapbook for the town that they put on the shelf in the library, they would use a wallpaper sample book from, I guess, whatever local business was selling wallpaper. So there was all this weird faux psychedelic stuff that all of these town things have been put into a scrapbook in. And I said, I don't know where I'm going to use that detail, but that's so perfectly ridiculous that I have to say that some town did that somewhere. Uh, it hasn't come up yet that I could use that. And, and, you know, now I've put it out there so people can steal it. But um, I just thought that's absolutely hilarious that someone said, hey, we'll just use last year's wallpaper sample book for our town scrapbook and put it in the library. True story. I love that. Stephen? Okay, I've got, I've got one now. Um... Happened with Horn of the Kraken, Norse fantasy Viking adventure set in the Fate of the Norns Ragnarok role-playing game, game universe. Um, they, in studying Norse mythology, I came across the Selkie, the uh, seal people, who they don their seal skin and they become a seal. Then they come ashore, take off their seal skin, and can walk among humans as a human. And uh, they didn't have them in the game. So that rabbit hole that I fo followed down, I realized that this could really help with some of the uh, plot points I was having trouble of doing a logical way for the heroes to win through. So I created it for the game, and fortunately the publisher was amicable to the idea. And then they started, interestingly enough, they started playtesting the game, and the Selkie, who I'd always intended to be a non-player character, was so popular that in the modules, they've created her as a player character, and it's basically a new character class. So my down the rabbit hole of uh, Norse mythology has borne fruit with that. It has. Uh, I have to say, when I read Horn of the Kraken, uh, at the time that it came out, you made a lot of Facebook posts about various things that you had researched for it. And uh, one of the things that I particularly enjoyed was about the mead in the barrels that they'd keep outside. Yes. And how it would, would ice and become more and more concentrated as the winter went by. That stuff is rocket fuel. <laughs> Even just straight, it doesn't have to be frozen. I, 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 I've had an experience with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've had uh, modern meads from uh, some wineries in the Niagara region, but a uh, bit sweet for my, my taste. Uh, mm. Well, is there anything else anybody would uh, like to share? Going once, going twice. <laughs> uh, every rabbit hole is a potential new story or a potential new detail. So it is useful from that point of view to occasionally fall down a rabbit hole and say, oh, I can sock that away from later or that's a thing or, or that's a character. I had a whole character come out of doing some research and in one frame there was a guy in the background and i said i'm totally basing this character who hadn't been developed yet on what that person looks like um so yeah that can happen all the time you just you just don't know what you're gonna come across when you start researching and uh i have one important thing i want to say natasha congratulations oh yes uh, you have your first yeah. on your first book coming out and really happy for you it's a great feeling Oh, thank you so much. I'm very excited. One more month. 